All right. So let's, let's go to the first topic, breaking down the walls. So what kind of values and actions of the Christ, did the Christian church make to transcend ethnic barriers? And the first illustration that I wanted to bring up is the history and the impact of the Berlin Wall. It was, it was created, it was made in 1961 when the, Allied, when the Allies won World War II, Germany was occupied in four different sectors the British, the French, uh, the United States, and the Soviets. And the Berlin Wall was made by the Soviets to uh, separate uh, the allies to establish their own kind of own kind of nation. And so they had two different political economic systems and not many people could cross that wall. So there was a clear separation of um, capitalist and communist values. And so you see this, these pictures describe and show um, the division, the hostility, the anger, uh, and lives were at stake. But in, in the 1960s, you see this picture of one of the monuments of the Berlin Wall, uh, a face of uh, John F. Kennedy, and also another figure, that cutoff figure is Ronald Reagan. Uh, there were two Americans who uh, made the push to destroy the wall. And one of the quotes that John F. Kennedy said during the time that this wall was uh, the most obvious and vivid demonstration of the failures of the communist system for all the world to see. We take no satisfaction in it for it is an offense not only against history but an offense against humanity. Separating families, dividing husbands and wives and brothers and sisters, and dividing a people who wish to be joined together, freedom is indivisible. And one man is, and when one man is enslaved, all are not free. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is "Ich bin ein Berliner." This is a symbol of division, of hostility, separating families and people. Walls symbolically. Um, are made to divide countries. And if it wasn't for John F. Kennedy and, to, and also um, Ronald Reagan, the wall was broken down at 1989. But there were other hostile walls that were made way before the 1960s. And the way that Ephesians chapter two verses 11 through 22, there is a description about another wall that was brought down that were created by man and how God broke down the wall of another spiritual hostility, but also the ethnic hostilities that we have within the church. I'm going to ask uh, Hyunmin Hong to just read this section for us and uh, just and I highlighted and bolded um, some of the main main descriptions. Hyunmin, if you don't mind reading this for us, it's a lot of verses. Yeah, I know, but you could do it. All right. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two of the two 
so making peace, and might reconcile us both in God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. And through him, we both have access to one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Thanks, man. So what do we get from this uh, long section in Ephesians? Well, first of all, we were all strangers and aliens separated from God. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ and his his incarnation who identified with us, who died on the cross, that was the first wall that was broken. Jesus came in the flesh. He became one of us. When Christ became human and died on the cross, he broke down the dividing wall of hostility between us and God. The gospel is now become a race transcending message, the ultimate unifier. And since we've been reconciled us, uh, between us and God, there has to be another wall that, that is broken down between the flesh. The issue in the Church of Ephesians that there were these ethnic barriers that people cannot get over. It was between the Gentiles and the Jews. And so this appeal of the gospel forces us to see that we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are all fellow citizens and saints and members in the household of God. That becomes our new identity. And therefore, uh, we have this mission together to build a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So that's a gospel, specific gospel application to race relations in the church. So, again, some of the relevance truths. Here's the logic. The gospel of Jesus Christ broke down the walls of hostility between us and God. Secondly, because God's people are no longer divided by the wall of hostility, we must also break down the dividing walls of our own ethnic barriers. And back then it was Jews and Gentiles, but apply that in your personal context. And the final fact says that now that considering each other as fellow citizens and saints, we all build together a spiritual structure of God by the spirit and in the world. How does this uh, actually flesh out in the history of the church? We're going to take two passages in Acts on how this was implemented. It wasn't always perfect, but we have some areas where it applied. Can I ask Elder Billy to read verses 19 through 21? I want to keep you on your toes here. Sorry, I don't have it up. <laughs> Do you have the... Okay, what, what is it again? Can you see the monitor, the shared slide? No, uh, maybe I'm just, oh, okay, yeah, I have it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so what, what verses 19 through 21? It's on the slide, yeah. Okay, all right. So now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Thanks, Billy. So we see that in the startup church in Acts, the church was being persecuted, and they were scattered. The, the gospel 
people were only wanting to preach to the Jews, but in the the church in Antioch, it also attracted people who were from outside. And so you see Phoenicia, Cyprus, and the Jews, but you also read about Cyprus and Cyrene, and they all came and these people were Greeks, Hellenists. And so they, oops, and so the church also found this need to preach to them outside of their own uh, tribal uh, culture and ethnicity. And as a result, a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So this is a startup church. It wasn't always, they didn't expect, the people in the church didn't expect to bring the word to different groups and different nations. But God sent them to these strategic areas of diversity, and it ended up becoming uh, more ethnically open. And when a church really grasps that, um, there will be a multi-ethnic and also a multiplying church. Two chapters later, in chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, we see the result of this change. Uh, can I ask Agnes to read this section? Uh, yeah. Uh, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, yep. Lucius of Cyrene, Manayan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Good. Thank you. So the Antioch church not only grew in number, but they also grew in diversity. They become uh, culturally, like they, they came from Greece. They came from Africa. They came from Asia and Saul being a Jew. And with a multi-ethnic church, they also multiplied. And they also sent in this last verse three, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. We, guess, we get a list of diversity, but also for that singular mission to plant churches outside of their own culture and from their own race. And Paul went off with Barnabas and he partnered with Timothy and he partnered with Titus and um, Silas. And so these are, this is the history of the church. They all believed in the gospel and the gospel application of breaking down the walls of hostility made them see people outside of their own ethnicity to build this kingdom of God. And the rest is history. So this was the church. These are little pictures of the church in Antioch. And just a real quick recap, the case study of, for the church of Antioch. We see that it was diverse culturally. Antioch was also divided but it was also strategic. The way that God wanted to move in this church with the message that he united all to include ethnic diversity and the leadership they established were from, were from Asia, Africa, Jewish, and European descent. And therefore they were sent off in the world. That was the history of the church in antiquity. Um, so what kind of values and actions did the church, Christian church make to transcend ethnic barriers? Is simply understanding and believing in the gospel. Uh, the differences that we have in race and skin color and ethnicity 
should not be the primary divider. Um, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to unify all believers to him. So that is the church. I wanted to pause here to give some time of like questions and reflections that you picked up from the history of the church. Let's go to the history of the American church, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So where did it all go wrong? We read pretty cool, inspiring stories from scripture, but sometimes there is a complete disconnect on our experience today and especially in the American church. We won't be able to cover the history of the Christian church that did play a, a lot of the dark roles of genocide and the Crusades, but let's kind of tie this into more modern church history, modern American church history. Jean Venier, uh, he wrote this quote that kind of speaks to this disconnect. The word became flesh to bring people together, to break down the walls of fear and hatred that separate people. That's the vision of the incarnation to bring people together. In his prayer for unity, Jesus prayed that we might all become one. We have this incredible vision of peacemaking 2,000 years in the making. There may be another 50,000 years left to go. I don't know. But Christ is always working to bring people together. The danger is what Martin Luther King Jr. said. We have this tendency to push some people down so that we could rise up. He identifies the problem as a problem of power. The problem of power is, has this thread throughout American history. The historical racial disunity is first established in the transatlantic slave trade. Secondly, in more of our modern, um, modern century, the Jim Crow laws, separate but equal, um, having discrimination between color and white. We see systemic injustices. The problems of power, there are is inevitable mistrust between majority white culture and black communities and other people of color. Problems of power, uh, the perceptions of neutral and hostile threats. Police don't get incredibly threatened or charged when they pull over another white person, but why over people of color? When a white family moves into the neighborhood, there isn't a sense of suspicion, but why when Hispanic or African-American uh, people move into the neighborhood, there is a little bit more um, tension. And then there is problems of power and personal experiences. Uh, maybe they've experienced childhood and family trauma I'm sure that you've seen a lot of the, the viral videos that are um, discriminating Asians um, here and even in the Bay Area. Really hard to watch. Uh, perhaps it's even in the church culture, the leadership, and vocational nepotism, where it's kind of a, a white man's club in business and in tech you name it. And so we see the problem of power in all three of these little uh, headings. People like, maybe we like people because we need to push people down in order to feel that we are bigger. Let's get a little bit more specific. Race Reconciliation in the American Church, Dr. Otis W. Pickett, professor of history in Mississippi College, and you can't get more south than Mississippi. Uh, he observes this, this long quote in research. In my studies, I've seen how race was socially constructed through particularizing an ethnic ethnicity of people, Africans, 
as somehow inferior and thus worthy of enslavement. This eventually led to systematic, profit-driven man-stealing. It was unbiblical and unchristian. Do not let any person try to convince you that Africa-based slavery be beginning in the 17th century was biblical. It was not. It was race-based, for-profit, man-stealing, with no hope of freedom for those who were enslaved. Men, women, and children were ripped away from their families, and millions would die in the horrific Middle Passage. The Christians who live in these societies are culpable and connected with the sin because they live comfortably off of the fruits of this trade system and largely, largely did not speak into this traffic of human beings until the late 18th century. He also writes, when slavery made an agrarian economy profitable, the church, largely in the South, began its pro-slavery position. Fledgling congregations and their young pastors would not have a strong position on the Southern landscape until they were able to woo the older landed male partner elites to their churches. Uh, it's, it's so tied to, unfortunately, uh, to the Christians. And they discriminated since the beginning and the foundations of American history. And what were they trying to protect? They were trying to protect their own profit. They were trying to protect their own power. And the South still has residual effect over this really horrific idealism. That's the bad, but it gets a little uglier. The Ku Klux Klan uh, is closely tied to uh, white Christianity. And this article by Randall J. Stevens in the New York Times um, wrote this. He, he wrote, Kelly Baker rightly reminds us that the second clan drew deep from, well, deep from the well of white Protestantism and nationalism. The organization's fierce religious bigotry and xenophobia appealed to the millions of Americans in the 1920s, the era marked by social experimentation, prohibition, a new morality, nativism, and drastic social change witnessed in the rise of America's most notorious homegrown brand of fascism. Klansmen and women, Baker notes, celebrates hearth and his home and home white America and patriotic nationalism, or 100% Americanism, as they put it. The maintenance of white supremacy, says Baker, becomes particularly obvious in the artifacts that white supremacists, like the Klan, create and use the American flag, the hood and robe, and the burning cross were their symbols of choice. They may, they may say that the Ku Klux Klan isn't um, as powerful as it was, which might be true, but the idealism is still there. Um, people in places of power, and they tie it to the extremes of, um, of Christian values with their, um, with their Patriotic, nation, patriotic nationalism of white America. We can't deny that. Um, it's part of the history and it's ugly. Um, and the residual still kind of makes an impact today in places of power, either in politics, in the police force, uh, in churches. And this cannot be ignored, which is really, really troubling. There's also racism in complicity. So complicity is more of a passive, apathetic position in the discussions of race. So it might not be as direct as the Ku Klux Klan, but we still see residual effects of complicit people in the discussions of race. This comes from the quote from The Color of Compromise, 
the truth about Americans' churches' complicity in racism. And the author writes this, um, Christian complicity with racism in the 21st century looks different than complicity with racism in the past. It looks like Christians responding to Black Lives Matter with the phrase, all lives matter. It looks like Christian consistently supporting a president whose racism has been on display for decades. It looks like Christians telling Black people and their allies that their attempts to bring up racial concerns are divisive. It looks, it looks like conversations on race that focus on individual relationships and are unwilling to discuss systemic solutions. Perhaps Christian complicity in racism has not changed after all. Although the characters and the specifics are new, many of the same rationalizations of racism still remain. It's a hot take, I'm sure. Um, not everybody agrees with this. But I put this to give another side to the, the more sophisticated and unblatant racism that happens in our nation and in our church. And this is a quote that I'll admit I've fallen into. Um, with my own ignorance and my own complicity, I in the past have tweeted All Lives Matter. Um, it was an ignorant statement. And this was back in back in Ferguson. And I'm I've changed, I've learned, and I've grown, and I really regret what I said. The complicity, I think, is a more prevalent issue in, in the Asian church. I also don't understand why, like, I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, even in the, the underlying, underlying quote, unwilling to discuss systemic solutions. I'm still lost in that because I also currently say, hey, it's all about personal individual relationships. But what am I doing to be more of an active voice in my local government and politics? So these are just kind of the, the thoughts that really challenge me, that push me, uh, that hit kind of a couple of nerves that I need to discover in my own heart. I don't know if you have any thoughts or reflections with that take. I would love to hear how you are processing it as well. If you have any questions, it's this book is from Jamar Tisby. Yeah, I, I think the only thing I wanted to um, point out is that, yeah, this, this is a perspective on racism and complicity. So like, I think someone could have be complicit but not have this type of view, you know, so to speak. Because if you look at this, I mean, someone can look at how he's responding as a, a very leftist type of view, um, as opposed to someone that might be more conservative and they might still be complicit but not kind of describe it in this way. Yeah, thanks, Billy. I, I want to just be fair with the resources that are out there, a lot of the books that are taking both sides. And again, like, I'm not trying to, like, ignore some quotes that appeal to just my palate. But just a challenge uh, from another, another perspective. But thanks for sharing that, Billy. Yeah, that's good. But there, there is good, and there is hope. Um, Otis, uh, Otis Pickett concludes his essay with some of, some of the solutions. And he writes this, I believe that in order to have true reconciliation, we must openly and honestly walk through our shared history and truth tell. I also believe that only in Christ can true reconciliation happen. 
Only Christ can redeem something as dark as two centuries of the institution of slavery, plantation brutality, legalized Jim Crow segregation, lynching without due process, violence against peaceful protesters, the murder of innocent leaders, as well as continued violence against black males and our current situation of mass incarceration. Further, it is only through Christ that our African-American brothers and sisters will have the grace necessary to forgive us and love us. As Legan Duncan, Chancellor of the Reformed Theological Seminary, has said before, it is not us who ask for forgiveness who are the heroes. It is the one who grant it who are the heroes. Our role is to listen, love, serve, repent, and humble ourselves. We need to pursue relationships with these brothers and sisters and use the benefits of our privileged status to be advocates in the best we, best way we can. There's a long way to go, but there is hope in the spiritual power of the gospel. I liked his paraphrase from Legan Duncan, who is uh, white. The thought of the one who grant forgiveness are the ones we should admire and the role to listen love and serve and repent and humble ourselves might seem passive but it's also very powerful to listen to their experience and we'll get to more of that so the history is dark we need to truth tell and i think there's a lot of the um the issues that still lie underneath. Racism isn't as blatant, but I think there's a lot more sophisticated and subtle racism that happens in our nation too. Uh, are we aware of it? But um, again, there, this is for your own understanding of how far um, we've come from and how much farther we have to go. I highlighted this um, because it's all good. Reconciliation is about obedience. Reverend Barry Henning, he writes, instead of the biblical picture in the early church ought to help us know the gospel is powerful enough to see that rich and poor, slave and free, black, white, Latino, Asian American, Asian American Indians, and formerly educated and street educated can all be called to be members of the one family of God. And we are all called to the same sacrifices and service to forgive and love one another in a community that is constantly embracing one another and the outcast and the broken and shows this same love for the world, even our enemies. What is it that has kept us from such practical, real expression of the reconciling love of God for one another, except cultural pride and self-protection. It's all encompassing the gospel. It's not only the ethnic barriers, but maybe the socioeconomic barriers, educational barriers, um, vocational barriers. And uh, the gospel is power, powerful enough to free us from all that. Um, and so the bias shouldn't just be focused on race, but other issues that are involved with it. Some personal quick implications. I know that we're at nine o'clock, um, but forgive me, uh, we're, we're just gonna power through. One of our natural reactions to both and the other and to the suffering is to move away from it. Tearing down walls means being proximate to the suffering and pain of others. It means experiencing it. It also means speaking up when it happens. Another quote, but as we live with people who have been crushed, as we begin to welcome the stranger, we will gradually discover the stranger inside of us. When we welcome the broken outside, they call us to discover the broken inside. We cannot really enter into a relationship with people who are broken unless somehow we deal with our own brokenness. There's a cost that comes to breaking down the walls. It's not just the action of tearing down those barriers, but it's actually asking you to get proximate. 
to get close, to let go of your power, your status, and to identify those who are seemingly lesser. That's what Jesus did. In order for us to relate to Jesus, he related to us by becoming flesh. He identified with the poor. He identified with the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the marginalized in society. He identified with the Samaritan woman. And that is how he didn't build up walls, but he also built bridges. So know how difficult it is to even just step and lean into racial reconciliation. It's a willingness to identify with someone's pain and hurt. That's the first, uh, that's the second section, but we have another section to go. Let's get into the personal individual responsibility and actions, pursuing gospel relationships. Let's talk about loving neighbor. Jesus, Mark 12, 30, love your neighbor as yourself. And this little picture kind of describes it all. Love thy neighbor, thy homeless neighbor, thy Muslim neighbor, thy black neighbor, thy gay neighbor, thy immigrant neighbor, thy Christian neighbor, thy Jewish neighbor, the atheist neighbor, and the addicted neighbor. The neighbor is all encompassing. There's no specifics, but it's all inclusive. So what does that, what does that look like? Um, we have that verse, love thy neighbor, but I think we need to also discern loving ideally versus loving actually the reality of it romans 13 8 through 10 says fulfilling the law through love owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law for the commandments you shall not commit adultery you shall not murder you shall not steal you shall not covet and any other commandment are summed up in this word you shall love your neighbor as yourself Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Last week, we kind of talked about um, how we are dishonoring our neighbor by believing in the lies that we tell ourselves, that racism stems from believing in false truths, and that is doing wrong against your neighbor. But um, this is a commandment that fulfills the law of Christ. But let's talk about the reality of it. This is a picture of Dostoevsky's um, father, Zazima from the brothers Karmazov. He says, love in action is harsh and dreadful thing compared to love with dreams. Peter Kraft, Christianity for Modern Pagan says this, scripture never tells us to love humanity or to love ideals, only to love our neighbors, all of them, one by one. Humanity is a dream. Love, uh, humanity is a dream, neighbor is a fact. Uh, we need to just kind of understand that we like the idea of loving neighbor, but the reality is it comes at a cost. It's it's dreadful, it's painful, it takes up our resources and our time and our energy and an effort to love our neighbor specifically. So what are some examples and ways to practice loving neighbor across ethnic divides? And here are just, they're not, these are just suggestions. Um, they're not gospel, but uh, these are some suggestions to read scripture together with them. Watch movies with kids that show racism and then talking about it. Serving the poor and overcoming socioeconomic boundaries with actual neighborly love. Uh, this comes from a book from a, a white person. So it's like shopping at international grocery stores. It's like, well, we do that all, all the time as Asians, but uh, to open up experiences and cultures from where you live. Talk to parents and families whose paths you cross um, with kids. Find people different from you and have them over for dinner and take time to listen to their story. That is doable. That is huge. A pastor said, what are you doing in the racial reconciliation movement? It's like, well, how many people of color have you invited over to your home for a meal? Um, that's actual instead of ideal. 
use hospitality to start relationships in your neighborhood so you can understand needs and meet them tangibly. It all just comes down to uh, having social connection points and through social connection points uh, to build relationships, to open up trust and to advocate for the people that are your neighbor and who you love. Let's talk about handling microaggressions. I wanted to get a little bit more specific because sometimes we're not only responsible for change, but maybe as Asian Americans, we're victims of, of these microaggressions. So I will also want to talk to the side of being a recipient from uh, racism. Have you experienced unintentional bigotry or racist comments? And how did you handle it? Um, some of these microaggressions can come in the forms of, hey, your English is actually pretty good. Like, how long have you been living in the States? You seem white. Um, oh, like, you're in... Uh, you're not a lawyer, you're not a doctor, like, did you go against your family values? Like, these are unintentional uh, bigotry or racist comments, and these are called microaggressions. Um, unintentional racism by Dr. Alexander Jun, who's going to be one of our Christ Central speakers uh, coming up, and he's going to share his own experiences. He writes that racial microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal behavior or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial in slights and insults towards people of a non-dominant group. They might come from an ignorant place, but it still has an impact on us, and we got to just kind of call that out. The reason why microaggressions happen in, um, for Asian Americans are three things. Asian Americans will always be perceived as perpetual aliens, foreigners, and outsiders by an outside culture, and in this case, white culture. The implicit definition of America is narrow and incongruent to their paradigm that their paradigm of education or a paradigm of socioeconomic background um, and that we will not always measure up to their uh, narrow uh, worldview of what an American should be. And this other phrase, white normativity, uh, they assume that cultural and racial standards um, in mainstream society, we don't, Asians don't meet up to that. And again, it's not just a white problem. We may have faced microaggressions and discriminations from other racial communities as well. So this is just acknowledging the fact that we might just be caught in, a, in the sticky middle, as I would say. The sticky middle of um, the caricaturized Asian American or the Asian group. And I acknowledge that may, maybe some of us have experienced that or are experiencing it in our current situation. But what can we do about it? The effect of microaggressions. Um, we may have faced alienation, isolation, tribalism, inferiority, and hostility. I will unpack that later, but I wanted to get to the meat of this discussion. Responding to microaggressions, two things. There's always intent, and then there, there's a more important factor, impact. Intent is basically saying, oh, I didn't mean that. That's not who I am. I didn't mean any harm. Uh, you're being sensitive and suck it up. 
when someone just kind of like slips. But what does intent do? It shifts the focus on themselves, not about the offended, but about the offender. I didn't intend may sound non-malicious, but it does not ex excuse the pain and the hurt it caused. I mean, intent, if someone, if someone like hits you with their car, it's like, oh, I didn't mean to hit you with my car. I'm not a bad driver. Um, maybe you were in the way and I just didn't see you. That's not good enough. But the impact of what happened is what matters the most. I don't care how good of a driver you are, you still broke my leg and you're gonna do something about it. Uh, I'm not gonna just hobble off and pretend that it just didn't happen and say, oh yeah, I believe you. There is impact that happens. Impact should sound a lot like this. I didn't mean that, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I didn't mean to hurt you. Thanks for calling me out, it won't happen again. How many times have you heard that after a microaggression? It's acknowledging that there was impact, that there was something that was cutting to you. The power of impact focuses and acknowledges and listens to how their words cause pain. It's removing the offender's defense case and focuses on the hurt it caused to, pre to prevent the perpetual ignorance of privilege and to invite the victim's experience to create a self-awareness. So the next time you might face a microaggression, I think for Asians, we handle it kind of passively. I mean, that's what, how I would respond. It's like, oh, it's okay. But instead of addressing it and calling it out, does that, per does that perpetuate the ignorance of privilege? That really challenged me. And to invite them through a victim's experience and for them to go through the process of self-awareness is a helpful and healing conversation. May God bless you on how that bridge is built because sometimes I just go with my default, but uh, you have the posture and the position to share how those ignorances have been cutting, but to also share it with grace. Some final thoughts. It takes a certain amount of humility and self-awareness to admit that one is racist. A racist person can grow up in a racist system and not realize it. Moving forward, we need to focus on our actions, even our unintentional actions and their consequences and do whatever we can take to make things right. This is an act of reconciliation, selfless love and hospitality that we need to covenantally practice. We must be ever mindful of people who are different from us and embrace them. We must confront our biases. We must recognize the impact of our unintentional actions towards us, others. We must begin to heal. So it cuts both ways. I think even if we are the offender or the offended, um, unintentional microaggressions, racism must be called out in order for them for the healing process to begin. The final take home point that I would like to wrap up with is love thy neighbor. No exceptions, no reservations. And loving is hard. It's going to demand a lot from us, but pace yourself, right? Love is not a sprint, but a marathon. Pace love for the long game. This is a challenge that I want to give you this week. Um, perhaps one of the prayer requests that we have is to identify at least one person that we could really love and identify in their pain. Um, 
and we'll talk more about Christ and culture next week. This is an individual responsibility, but next week we're going to talk about the citizens' responsibility in more of the political um, political sphere and racism and culture. So just stay tuned for next week. Um, we're broadening our our categories um, for next week. But that is the pause that I wanted to have on this section. What are some ways you can love your neighbor to those who are different than you this week? Knowing a little bit more about microaggressions, how does this change the way you see both the offender and the offended? Any questions before we hit our prayer time? Any quick ones? Um, even though I might not be able to answer it today, something that we could all kind of chew on and address together in a later time. It might be a lot to process. It's like drinking from a fire hose. And again, I'm available for you guys um, after the discussion. If you wanted to stick around or just email me, contact me. I am more than willing to hear your thoughts and your questions. Let's close in prayer. Two topics of prayer. We talked about breaking down the walls. Uh, first, let's praise that God broke down the walls of hostility for us. And also pray that we would break down our own walls as, uh, as well through love. The other prayer request is to give a personal touch. Pray for one person you know who feels hurt, alienated, or a victim to racial abuse. Pray to identify their pain and to be present through their pain. Let's take just a quick minute to privately pray and I'll close this in prayer and we'll move on to just some quick announcements on what to expect next week. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this moment, this time, as we pause and reflect on what you have taught us. Lord, we especially give you thanks for breaking down the walls that were built behind our sin and the hostility that we had against you. Thank you, Jesus, that you came down as a person to identify with us in our isolation, our alienation, our pain. And Lord, by your grace and your mercy, you've reconciled us to you by giving up your own life. Father, since we know the gospel and we believe it, may that be the mission statement that allows us to reach people to those who are different than us. Lord, may we be aware of the own walls that we built up in ourselves, in our own hearts. 
and to be honest and open to break those down because you have already done it. Lord, we recognize a a lot of the pain and the hurt in the history of the church, and we desire to be better. Lord, forgive us for um, the areas we've been ignorant, showing unintentional bias and racism towards our brothers and sisters in Christ and to those who are our neighbors. Lord, give us the courage to love well and to love deeply. Father, we know that there are neighbors around us who are feeling a lot of pain, but Lord, give us the the motivation to identify with their pain, to listen to them, and to understand a little bit better on where they come from. Lord, I especially thank you for this class and the courage that they have just to lean in to this topic. Uh, May we learn and grow, but also be transformed by the power of your spirit to be the people you call us to be, to be imitators of Christ and to be the ones who are showing light in this world and in our communities. And until then, Lord, um, we wait for you. So thank you for all that you've shared with us and we give you all the praise and glory. In your name we pray, amen. Just a quick announcement. Again, I assign homework for further study. We can't touch upon all the topics, but I will send these resources out in an email. Um, Since next week, we're going to be talking about race and culture and where do we go from here. I wanted you to read Jeremiah 29 on loving the city that you're in. Um, There's a really good article by Kevin DeYoung, Faith Seeking Understanding thinking theologically about race tensions, and it gets a little bit more nuanced in the the present issues that we're in. And if you haven't watched the Redeemer video of Race and Justice by Tim Keller and Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy, I highly recommend that. Um, But hopefully these are just starters for you. Um, The discussion goes deep. And again, I'm here to hear you out and to pray for you and also to help you in your own process of race and the Bible. That's it. Thank you so much for staying till 924. Uh, Appreciate you guys. And next week, we'll also just kind of continue on with our personal sharing. If you haven't shared, um, you're under the gun next week. So, but that's it for today. Um, Yeah, I'm going to stick around just for a little bit longer if you wanted to stay. But until then, man, have a wonderful week. Good night, and it's good to see you.